I was a man who lived some 700 years before Christ was born. And that's some, th- some 2,700 years before we were born and, uh, and before our time too. So how do we know that these words are an accurate record of, of the words that were spoken by Isaiah? In fact, 700 years later, um, after they were written, Jesus um, read them himself too. He went into uh, a synagogue. So we read this in uh, Luke chapter 4, where you read, and Jesus came, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. So it would have been a big scroll, and he's got a big rack there, Uh, you can see on the picture, to read it from. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So, yeah, he, re- he read those words. Um, and, and then he went on to expound on them. But how was Jesus so confident that the words he was reading, considering they were first spoken about 700 years before he was born, were an accurate record of the revealed words prophesied by Isaiah? Well, a lot of it comes down to the work of the scribes. The scribes were the people who uh, collected these words and, uh, and, and made sure that they were written down and passed on from generation to generation. They meticulously copied these down. So how do we know that, that the scribes kept an accurate record? Well, the answer is very much found in archaeology. Now, archaeology, for me, is one of the most tangible pieces of evidence of, for, for the accuracy and the reliability of God's word. For instance, Babylon is a place that featured, uh, or features, I should say, a great deal in the Old Testament. Um, it's a city which had great significance at the time, uh, a very powerful empire, actually, the Babylonian Empire. And, and it's spoken about in the kings and in many of the prophets, including Daniel and in Ezra and Nehemiah. So it's there, but this city was destroyed. It was wiped away, and actually the Bible predicted that that would happen. But um, for many centuries, uh, sceptics of the Bible uh, said, well, where is this Babylon? There's, there isn't a Babylon. It's, 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 there's no sign of it. And it was almost uh, 2,000 years before it was found. And Babylon was indeed found. And and around about the 1800s, there was a lot of archaeology went on. And the picture you can see there depicts uh, some of the archaeology there. And I think, I believe that's probably the Ishtar Gate that they've uh, they've uncovered there. You can see the, just on the top right of the pillar there, you can see the the lion that that was on, on the Ishtar Gates. And if you go to 100 miles down the road to uh, the British Museum, uh, you can see many, many artefacts that were found in Babylon. And so we know the Bible was true. The the Bible uh, told us about Babylon. It really did exist. And so archaeology is a great great example, really, of of the evidence for the accuracy of, of the Bible. And so we come to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are almost in a, a league of their own. Um, it was one of the greatest discoveries of the twen- archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. They were discovered by young Bedouin shepherds in the 1940s. Many of you may be familiar with this, this story. Some of you, it may be new to you. But they were out searching for their flock of goats um, at the end of the day. So it's, they were living in a very sort of arid area. It's down at the Dead Sea, one of the lowest points on Earth. Um, a very arid environment, but the here and there there's tufts of grass and things that these, their goats could uh, eat. So they, they, would, they would take them out each day to look for this, for this grass. And at the end of the day, they, they want to go home, get the goats home. And so 
one of the lads is throwing stones up into these um, caves that you can see on the picture there. And there's another picture of it there. This is a Qumran. And, um, and he hears a, 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 an unfamiliar sound, a sound he's not expecting to hear. There's a smash, um, a, a loud smash which comes from inside the cave. And he was expecting just to hear it sort of rattle around like you would if you threw a rock into a cave. But it was a, it was a smash instead. And, and this intrigued him. He thought, well, could this be some kind of treasure? Um, but obviously, at the end of the day, they had to go home. So they went home with the flocks. And you can imagine them talking about this. And the next day, they planned to go back, have a look, have an explore in this cave and see what was in there. And that's exactly what they did. They went back the next day. Uh, they went, they found the cave, went inside. And they were kind of disappointed uh, by what they found and kind of intrigued as well. What they found were stone jars. So this is kind of a, a reconstruction of what it might have looked like. So there's these jars, and uh, some, some are you know, in good condition, some not, but you, you take the lids off, and inside there's, there's uh, gold. No, no gold, no silver, nothing, nothing too exciting, just, just a load of old scrolls, um, which to young lads probably isn't, you know, I don't know, is that exciting? Maybe, it could be something exciting written on it, but, you know, maybe not. It's not as exciting as they were hoping anyway. But, um, but they knew they'd found something of significance. So they took the scrolls home um, and uh, they took them back to uh, probably their, their dad. They lived, Bedouins, as, as you probably know, live in tents. Um, so they went back to the tent and uh, you'd, you'd have a, in, normally a big pole in these sort of Bedouin tents. And that's where they hung the, um, the scrolls while they wondered what on earth to do with them. Um, you know, you imagine Dad, he has a look at it and he can't work out what it is either. And, but he thinks, well, maybe it could be valuable, we don't know. And it hung around in this tent apparently for a, for a while until they took it to Bethlehem and met up with two Arab antiquities dealers who gave them some money for them. So they were quite happy. They made a little bit of money out of it. Not, not a huge amount, but a bit. And uh, the dealers thought, well, we've got something interesting. Uh, maybe somebody will be interested in buying it. So they approached a monastery in Jerusalem and they, and they, um, they purchased them. And then there was a visit from an American uh, a scholar from the American School of Oriental Research. And he had a look at them and he revealed their antiquity. He, he could tell these were seriously old. And then, at a, a later date, there was a, a great archaeologist called William F. Albright. Um, and he came along, he had another look. And he announced that they were definitely from the period somewhere, he said, between 200 BC and 200 AD. He couldn't quite, you know, put his finger on, on it exactly, but, you know, he put a lot of research into it. And, and that's kind of the, the time uh, line that he came up with. So this cave, um, it produced some very interesting scrolls and... and, 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 and the age of these scrolls was kind of mind-blowing. This, this is like, you know, 2,000-year-old um, stuff at least. Um, so very exciting. And this, this collection sort of, um, when, it, when it sort of came together, what, what they found, there was um, a well-preserved copy of the entire prophecy Isaiah, of Isaiah, so a very large scroll. It's the oldest copy of an Old Testament book ever to be discovered. There was another fragmentary scroll of Isaiah, um, a commentary on the two chapters of Habakkuk, and the commentator explained the book allegorically in terms of the Qumran Brotherhood. So the Qumran Brotherhood, we'll kind of cover that a little bit more as we go along, um, but just to say that somebody created this library of books. Um, so uh, we're referring to them at this point as the Qumran Brotherhood. There were people there, a brotherhood, um, of people who collected these things. And they had a, a community, if you like. And the, the, one of the other things they found was a manual of discipline or community rule, which was the most important source of information about this religious sect at Qumran. So these were people and they had their, their rules and regulations that they would follow, a code of conduct. There were thanksgiving hymns, which had sort of uh, psalms of thanksgiving and praise. There was an Aramaic paraphrase of the book of Genesis. And then there was this other book called The Rule of War, 
which dealt with a battle that, uh, between the Sons of Light, which is um, the men of Qumran, uh, identified themselves with this, we believe, and the Sons of Darkness, which were possibly the Romans. Uh, and this was a battle which was yet to take place in the last days, which uh, the men of Qumran believed were about to arrive. So quite an interesting find. You know, we've got um, biblical scripts, and then we've got um, clues to the life of the people who, who had created this, this library. Um, I mean, one little aside, um, when they were looking for the... Uh, as I bring it in to get this collection together, and some of them had kind of strayed um, off to uh, places that perhaps they, sh they shouldn't have strayed. Um, there's uh, the Wall Street Journal there. Um, it turns up in the classi classified ads the four Dead Sea Scrolls, so man ma biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be a great gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual group. And in fact, um, a, a Jewish um, man um, at, that, at that point in time um, saw this advert. He bought them on behalf of the um, Israeli government and they were taken back to Jerusalem. Um, and, and that's where, really, that the collection sort of comes together and study starts to take um, place into, into, these, um, into these scrolls. So, in some cases, there were entire scrolls that were found. In others, it was just fragments. And the, the dry atmosphere of the, of the, um, of the area and, the, and the, in those caves had preserved much of the material very well. If, if we put them in uh, a cave in Wales or Scotland, or I don't know, the Peak District or somewhere, they would have just turned to compost, I'd imagine, with the sort of you know, damp um, environment that we have in our country. But over there, they, they, they preserved so well. I mean, 2,000 years, and they were still uh, readable, although obviously some had, had become fragments. So it's believed that the scrolls were hidden in the caves during the first Jewish uprising against the Romans in AD 66 to 70, which would kind of time it, tie in, wouldn't it, really, with the, this, this idea of this battle that was uh, to be between the Sons of Light, <coughs> men of Qumran, and the Sons of Darkness, perhaps the Romans. So um, that, that was the case. Now, no coins newer than AD 68 were found in the area um, at this point. So it would seem that, you know, they'd they been put in there and they'd been left, you know, these men of... Qumran had disappeared, probably in that battle, in that uh, in the, oh, the the Jews were overthrown um, by the by the Romans at this point, um, and so nobody ever went back uh, for two thousand years. Quite incredible that after all that time, these things were found. And experts spent many years um, putting these uh, this painstaking process of piecing together the scrolls. It was like the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle. And, in fact, the work really still continues today. Um, today we have uh, modern technology. Um, we've got cameras that can um, take pictures. We can put it onto uh, computers. We can sort of move things about. Um, we can, you know, look at things that you wouldn't have been able to see, even with a, a magnifying glass by the, the guys we've got on the uh, picture there back in the, back in the 1940s and 50s. So a lot has been discovered about it. Um, about 80% of it was written in Hebrew and about 20 was in Aramaic and Greek which was the, the language that, that Jesus would have uh, spoken at the time um, although Jesus I'm sure would have spoken Hebrew as well and would have been able to read it so since that time the remains of um, scholars have identified the remains of um, about 825 to 870 separate scrolls. And that includes 19 copies of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy, and 30 copies of the Psalm. So a, a great deal of um, material. And if you go to Jerusalem, they've uh, created this museum of the scroll, or it's sometimes called the Shrine of the Book. Um, so that white sort of object on the, uh, the left-hand side, I think that represents one of the lids of the, um, of the jars. And then the one on the right 
represents the inside. So we've got the scroll there, and we're pointing down the handle of the scroll, and with, it's kind of looking up. So it's quite a quite a clever artistic representation of the uh, of the the jars that the, the young lads found there. So you can go there and, and you can actually see these, uh, many, many of the scrolls sort of kept there and there's, there's copies and that sort of lit up sort of part uh, on the, that scroll handle there is actually the, uh, the great scroll of Isaiah. Um, the, the, it's a copy of it actually, but it goes all the way around and you can actually go right up to it and if you know Hebrew, you can read it. Um, so there's a, a gentleman there I presume knows a bit of Hebrew, and he's he's having a read. He, he could be reading those exact words that uh, we read earlier on um, from Isaiah, and, and that Jesus read himself. And that's quite amazing, isn't it? There was also uh, a very big scroll called the Temple Scroll. That's one of the biggest ones as well, which was uh, which um, describes uh, a temple that the uh, the men of Qumran believed would um, supersede the uh, the temple of um, Herod uh, and, and become a, a great temple. And there's also a very intriguing thing called a, a, the copper scroll, and that's a very big one as well. Um, so it's made of copper, and it's believed that is a treasure map. So that was quite exciting, wasn't it? Um, although when they've searched around for the, the, the give clues to where this treasure might be, nobody's ever found it. So it may still be out there, or it may have been sort of, it may have disappeared over the, over the millennia. People have sort of come across it and, uh, and took it. Now, I believe that this copper scroll, uh, being copper, you can imagine it would be quite difficult, 2,000 year old copper, it'd be quite difficult to open. I believe um, it was sent to Birmingham, which is just up the road from here, where, to the university there. I mean, Birmingham is a, uh, a, a city with a fine tradition of, um, of uh, making things, um, birth of the uh, Industrial Revolution, etc. cetera, um, engineering. Excellence, isn't it? And uh, I believe it was sent there to be kind of opened and and uh, and looked at. So it's an amazing find. It's an amazing story. But what is the significance of all this? That's the uh, that's the that's the title of our talk, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've got a little chart here. Um, and what it's what it's describing, I think, if on the right hand side is today. Um, and then on the left-hand side is going way back into history. So um, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, so back in the back in the 1940s, if you wanted to, if you wanted to say, well, I wonder, you know, this, you know, Paul's been talking about this um, Isaiah, and and he says, you know, is it, it's an accurate um, interpretation. Um, how does he? How how can we tell? What, what's the oldest Bible that we could find? And, and see if that's a, it's, it's as accurate as, as what we've been reading out today. Um, so the oldest you could go back to was um, around about a thousand years old, which was the, the Masoretic texts. Now the Masorets were a group of um, scribes who meticulously copied the Word of God. There weren't printing presses um, over a thousand years ago. Everything had to be written. And they, and they wrote and copied these things out. For a period of 500 years, from about 500 AD to 1000 AD, um, and then the work kind of stopped, and um, and that's that, that's that's what you would go back to. You'd go back, and, and obviously these these uh, manuscripts still exist today. But then you might say, well, okay, that's a thousand years, but there's a thousand years before that. Um, how do we know that they they've copied an accurate? copy of, of, uh, of, of things there. How, how, is it, how do we know it's accurate? Well, we didn't a thousand years ago, or you wouldn't have done um, in the, even in the 1940s. But we do now because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because the Dead Sea Scrolls fill the gap. So the challenge then was to have a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen the guy there be, be able to read it today and, and see if there was a change from between them and the Mas Masoretic texts. And, and as it says on the chart there, hopefully you, you can read that, there was no change. It's exactly the same. There's very, very minor uh, details, like the odd um, punctuation mark, things like that. But other than that, it's exactly um, as it's said. So 
that is um, a great significance, isn't it? That, that gives us great confidence that the, the Bible we're reading today is, um, is a, a true representation of the words that were um, written to, written, originally written um, by the prophets and, and has been preserved, really, miraculously um, by God, I believe. Um, it's an amazing testimony to the work of the scribes, but it is a testimony to the word of God and the accuracy of the Bible text. Obviously, our Bibles have been translated from Hebrew into English now, haven't they? So, you know, we, 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 can, we can discuss that, but we're, but we're, we're really looking at the, uh, the Hebrew text um, for our subject this afternoon or this evening. So that's one of the great significances, isn't it? That gives us confidence, doesn't it, that our Bible is, is an accurate representation of the original words. But there are other significances as well. And another great significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls is the timing. They were found, did you, did, who, can anybody remember when I said they were found? Sort of 1940s, didn't I? I said it was 1940s, okay? So it's actually around about 1946, 47, something like that. Well, in 1948, the Jewish state um, was, um, was brought about. Um, we've got a picture there of, of the inauguration of that state. And uh, so Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1946-47 in the Qumran Caves. And, and these, these, these Jews were, we came back to the land in 1948. Um, the Jews before that, they'd been persecuted. They, they'd been, you know, scattered throughout the world. They'd been persecuted, particularly by the Nazis and the Germans. And that's something we all... We all know about a terrible time, the Holocaust. They were, um, you know, imprisoned. They were persecuted. They were killed. A great act of genocide and cruelty uh, went on against these people. And at the end of the war, um, there was a, you know, a, obviously a big discussion. What, what can we do about this? Uh, where, where can the Jews create, uh, have a homeland? And they talked about places like Uganda... I believe Madagascar, um, as, as some. I mean, we're talking about uh, Rwanda today, aren't we, for sending uh, refugees to? Um, but they, they, they looked at, um, at these various places. But, you know, I think the Jews said, well, hang on, you know, our homeland is, 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 is Israel. There wasn't an Israel at the time. It was Palestine. It was, the, it was sometimes known as the Holy Land. But, um, but the, it was here they, they returned to. And this archaeology, these finds, it, it validated, really, didn't it, the, um, their, their claim that this was their homeland. So the timing is, is quite incredible, isn't it? Incredibly as well, um, as an aside in a way, these, these scrolls in, this, in these jars, they, they, if, you go to, if you find the, the prophet Ezekiel, um, and we go to chapter 37... Ezekiel chapter 37 actually predicted the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Um, so I'll just read a few verses from there. So Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. So Ezekiel, his prophet, had this vision and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said to me son of man can these bones live and I answered O oh Lord God thou knowest and if we're to read on it will transpire that these bones did indeed live they, they sort of you know rattled back together um, into skeletons the skeletons were then covered with sinews of, of, of flesh and, and then skin and then it stood up to be a great army. And, and, and what, it, what it's been described is the rebirth of a nation. And, and it very much describes, doesn't it, the rebirth of, of Israel. When you think of the, after the Holocaust, and the, you, know, you see pictures of piles of bones and, and, and bodies that were just, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an abhorrent uh, sight. But these, these things, um, it, you know, it's, it's this nation come back together and, and uh, very poignant, really, I think. And, and so, um, you know, and we go on to the, the 1940s and then on to 1967 when the, 
the nation of Israel was fully declared. So the timing is a, is a great significance. So what I'd like to do now is just have a little think about the, those who wrote the, um, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, these, these scribes, this community. So who wrote them? Well, there were several uh, different groups at the time of, uh, of, at this particular time. We read about them in the New Testament, don't we? We read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, the Samaritans we read about, uh, the Zealots are referred to. Um, most people didn't belong to any group, as it says down there. Um, and uh, Jesus taught, they were called the sinners, uh, many of those, because they weren't in the, any of these elite. But Jesus spoke to them, didn't he? He taught them. But there's one group in there, the Essenes, and they're not really mentioned in the New Testament. We never see that, that word. But they are described by several, um, several historians. Uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, he was a, an emperor who travelled his empire um, to sort of discover all its, all its uh, glories. And one of the places he went to was um, the Dead Sea. It was an exciting place to go. And um, in, his, in his writings, he noted um, this group of um, pious men who, who lived in the area. Uh, wearing very simple clothes. And then Josephus, the ancient historian, he describes them in this way. He says they were a strict, pious, messianic, Baptist group with manners, rites and doctrines, diligent in reading their sacred books. And that really um, chimes, doesn't it, with this idea of a, a group of people who are very, very precious about the Bible and, and, and looking after it and, and, and uh, keeping it and, and, and copying it meticulously. So it's believed that these people, these Essenes, they were a really religious Jewish sect. They broke away from temple-centred worship. It says workshop there, I think, but um, ignore that. It should say worship. Um, and they established a messianic-focused community. And, uh, and they settled at Qumran at the time of Jesus. Here, between the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, we call it the Inter-Testament period, um, the Greek Empire sort of came to the fore, and a lot of uh, the Greeks liked to sort of um, take over, and they, they wanted their culture to kind of take over. It, it was a Hellenistic culture, they called it. Um, but there were a lot of Jews who, who fought back and recoiled from that, and the, the Maccabees, for instance, they, they sort of claimed back um, the, the, the Jewish state. Um, and the Essenes and people like that, they, they would have been very very, very strict on trying to withdraw from these kind of worldly um, Greek kind of ways. Um, and, and, and so they were very, very focused on, um, on piety and, uh, and purity of, of, of lifestyle and, and, and uh, keeping away from this kind of worldly, worldliness. So that's why they would withdraw into the desert. Well, following the time of, um, of the, this discovery... The city of, uh, well, the let's say city is a, is, a, is a community, I suppose, where they live, but the town, if you like, of Qumran, the, we'll call it the Essene HQ, um, was, uh, was unearthed. So archaeologists went in there and they discovered many things. Um, so we can see on there, there's a, an aqueduct on the right-hand side coming in. Uh, so they, they needed water, obviously, to drink, to stay alive. But also, they were very, very uh, washing was very much part of their uh, ritual uh, lifestyle. They, everything had to be clean and pure. So there were baths, as you can see on there, um, cisterns. There's uh, a potter's kiln on the on the uh, lower left hand side. Um, you know, somebody had to make these clay jars, didn't they? So there's a, a bit of a clue there, isn't there? And, and there's these, these baths where they would wash. Um, and maybe even bat baptising uh, took place in, in these baths. So, yeah, lots of, lots of clues there to, um, to these people. And, and also there was this area called the scriptorium. Where, and this is the area where they would have done the writing and, and copying. There's sort of a, a little bit of a, an artist's uh, impression there of what that might have looked like. So we've got these um, people dressed in very simple... Uh, linen clothes and, and lots of linen fragments have been found on the site too. 
So that, that, that's the Essenes, that's, that's the kind of people they were. Um, so when we look at our New Testament, we, we perhaps see some, some, um, some of the influence, if you like, that the Essenes may have had on, on the uh, people at the time. So, for instance, if we, um, if we look at, uh, this is Luke chapter 3, um, we read there, um, Then came also publicans to be baptised, and they said to him, Master, what shall we do? And he said to them, Extract, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, but, and be content with your wages. And, it says, as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. So it does seem a period of expectation, doesn't it, when people were expecting Jesus to come back, or, or the Christ to come back, uh, or to appear, I should say, um, rather than come back. Um, so the, the people were in expectation. And, and you know, these are scenes that this is something that they were very, very much focused on, this messianic me um, sort of message. Um, so I'm going to turn over. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the this is in John chapter one. So um, again, we've got the uh, the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which, being interpreted, is the Christ. So again, we've got uh, expectation there, haven't we, of the Messiah coming back, and. Uh, this is the Samaritan woman, so much further up north. And uh, she says to Jesus, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And then she goes back to her own city and she says in verse 29, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And so the, the people were in expectation. So I, see, I think that's a you know, testimony in a way to the influence and the thinking if you like of the, of the times that Jesus was in it kind of opens a window doesn't it and we spoke about the purification uh, rituals that they went through and again um, in Mark chapter 7 we read about the, uh, the Pharisees and their obsession with cleanliness verse 2 they say when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile that is say on washing hands they found fault for the pharisees and all the jews except they wash hand their hands oft eat not holding the tradition of the elders and when they come in from the market except they wash they eat not and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots brazen vessels and of tables so you know it's uh, it it's kind of gives uh, a, a bit of validation i believe to to the new testament so We've seen, haven't we, um, this amazing uh, discovery, this amazing find, this incredible story. And we've seen the significance. So let's just sum up um, what we've seen there. Oops, gone too far back. Forward. Maybe. So we've seen, haven't we, that this, the accuracy of the scrolls gives us huge confidence in the accuracy and the authority of the Bible. We gain a window into the lives of the Essenes and the thinking of the Jews at the time of Christ. We saw the timing of the discovery as well. 2,000 years, nobody, you know, they were undisturbed. Exactly at the time when Israel were coming back into the land, they were suddenly found. That's incredible. And, and, it, and it validated their claim, didn't it? And then the, pre the pre prevent preservation of God's word for so many thousands of years is truly miraculous. So this really was the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. The very words that Jesus is quoted as reading in the New Testament are exactly what he read, exactly true. So if nothing else, please take away from this evening the fact that the scriptures are accurate. And if you believe, and if you're convinced they're accurate, then please look into the wonderful message of hope and salvation which are contained in its pages. Thank you.